Hi, my name is Dawn Matthews. Welcome to today's lesson on computer hardware. So far we have learned that input, processing and output are three important components of all computer systems. We have already had a good look at input and output devices. In this lesson, we will focus on processing and how that happens. We know that processing happens in the CPU and we will discover how input data gets to the CPU for processing. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to describe the route that data follows to the CPU, recognize the motherboard and the central processing unit or CPU inside the case, and describe the function of RAM and ROM. Let's remind ourselves of where the processor fits into the big picture. Remember that the CPU is one of the internal hardware components found inside the case. Most input and output devices are external devices found outside the case. Now for a computer to work, the external components have to communicate with the internal components. Do you see that these external components all have cables? Here's the cable for the monitor. Here's the cable for the mouse and the keyboard. These cables plug into the back of the computer and connect the external hardware to the internal components. The place where a cable connects into the computer is called a port. Now I'm going to unplug everything and let's work together to connect all the external components to the correct ports. First we must connect the keyboard and the mouse. But how do we know which cable plugs into which port? Well, some computers have made it easy and put a little symbol or icon under each port. This tells you if the port is for a mouse, a monitor or a keyboard. But even if there are no markings, you can still tell which cable goes where just by looking at the connector at the end of the cable. For example, look at this connector for the mouse. It has six pins and a plastic plug in the middle. This connector will only fit into one kind of port, like this. The same goes for the keyboard cable. This printer cable has a connector called a USB connector. It only fits into a USB port like this. When you're buying external devices, it's very important to check that the new device will be able to connect to your computer. Not all computers have the same kinds of ports, and if you buy a device that does not fit into the back of your computer, then you won't be able to connect them together. Now, let's connect the monitor. As you can see, the monitor has two cables. Why do you think this is? Well, it's all about power. You see, a mouse and a keyboard don't need very much power, so they only have one cable which carries both information and power. A monitor draws a lot more power than the mouse or a keyboard, so it needs its own power source. That's why it has two cables. One is to carry information and the other is to carry power. So we connect the monitor like this. First we plug in the cable that will carry information from the computer. Then we plug in the monitor's power cable. In most computers, this power cable goes into a separate port in the back of the computer case. The computer then plugs into the wall socket. So power is sent from the wall to the computer and from the computer to the monitor. If your computer does not have a second power port, don't worry. You do get some monitors that plug directly into the wall socket. Printers, scanners and other large external components also have separate power cables that plug into the wall. Now we have our external components plugged in, but there are still empty ports at the back of the computer. Manufacturers always put in a few extra ports so that we can plug in extra input and output devices at a later stage. 
So now that all our external components have been connected, let's connect power to the case and turn it on. The power cable goes in here and then plugs into the power socket in the wall. And we push the power button on the computer case and in front. The power button is used to switch the computer on as well as off. When the computer starts, we say it's booting up. Now the computer is on, let's test all our external components. Monitor, check. Mouse, check. Keyboard, check. Printer, check. Now we're going to open the case and see what is going on inside. But first, we must shut down and switch off the computer if the computer does not do so automatically. Remember, it's very important that you shut down the computer properly. Follow the prompts from the computer so that you avoid permanent damage. OK, we've removed all the external components in order to open up the computer and look inside. Let's start by removing the case. that out. I'm just going to put it at the back. Right, the inside of a computer looks quite complicated, but it's actually a very well organized machine. Let's start by looking at the large flat board at the bottom of the case. This is called the motherboard. If you look carefully, you will see that all the different internal components are plugged into the motherboard. The motherboard links and holds these components together. The purpose of the motherboard is to allow everything in your computer to work together and communicate with each other. As you can see, the motherboard has lots of components plugged into it. But today, we will only look at the components that play a role in processing. We've already discussed processing and the central processing unit in previous lessons. Processing is when the computer takes raw input data and turns it into organized information according to a set of instructions. And the CPU is the piece of hardware that does the processing. The CPU is a microchip. Like all microchips, it is made up of thousands of microscopic electronic circuits built on a silicon base. Now let's see if we can find where the CPU fits on the motherboard. And yes, it fits into this small square. Isn't it amazing? Without this small chip that is inside the square, the computer would not be able to carry out any instructions. No calculations, no graphics, no word processing, nothing. There are many different types of CPUs on the market. They have names like Pentium, Celeron, Athlon and G5 and are made by different companies like, for example, Intel, AMD, and Apple. But what does the CPU actually do? Well, the CPU fetches instructions and data from the memory and then processes these instructions. Now, we've only mentioned memory briefly before, so let's take a moment to discuss it more fully. Memory is where the computer stores programs, data, and instructions. There are two kinds of computer memory, primary memory and secondary memory. Today we're going to talk about primary memory. Secondary memory will be discussed in a later lesson. Primary memory is an internal hardware component of the computer. The amount of primary memory is one of the things that affects the speed of a computer. There are two types of primary memory, RAM and ROM. Each of these is a microchip that attaches to the motherboard. This is a ROM chip. ROM stands for read-only memory. ROM is used to store programs that are needed to start up the computer. For example, when you turn on the computer, there are a number of basic things that the computer does to get ready. This is called booting up. 
booting up a computer takes a minute or so and you cannot do any work on a computer until it has finished booting up. The booting up program is called Basic Input, Output System or BIOS and is saved permanently on the ROM chip. All programs stored on the ROM chip are small and do not need to be changed. ROM keeps its information even when the computer is turned off. Now this is a RAM chip. As you can see, it fits in this slot. Just get it in there. RAM is short for random access memory. Any information that the computer is busy working on is stored in RAM and will be lost if you turn off the computer without saving your work. For example, while you're typing up a letter on a word processor, the letter will be stored in RAM. But if you shut down the computer without saving, then all the work you have done on the letter will be lost. Now that we know about memory, we need to work out how information gets from the memory to the CPU and vice versa. Information travels between the different components on the motherboard through bus lines. Bus lines are a series of tiny wires that allow the different components to communicate with one another. So when data is input from one component on the motherboard, the bus lines carry that data to another component. For example, RAM sends data through the bus lines to the CPU. The CPU does the processing and then outputs the information to other components through other bus lines. Now that you have seen some of the internal components of a computer, let's take a closer look at what happens when you enter information into the system. As you know, the mouse and the keyboard are just two of many input devices. These two input devices accept information that you input and it is then converted into a format or language that the CPU can work with. But have you ever thought about what kind of language a computer understands? Obviously, computers cannot understand English or any other human language. But they do understand a language called machine code which is a binary system. This special code is written entirely in zeros and ones. These zeros and ones represent off and on in computer language. So machine code is like a long line of light switches with some turned on and others turned off. We will learn more about this binary system in another series of lessons. Now back to the motherboard. We're going to see exactly what happens when you use your computer. So fasten your seat belts because here we go. When you click with your mouse or enter a keystroke on the keyboard, data is sent along the cable to the port. From the port, the data will flow along the bus lines to memory. The CPU then uses the data in memory to carry out its instructions. This is called processing. Information that has been processed is then sent by the CPU to an output device such as a monitor or printer. This is called output. And there you have it. Input, processing, output. The three most important computing processes. Did you get all that? Well, let's go over it again and this time we're going to have a treasure hunt. Sound good? Right, let's send Archie into the computer and see what they can find. Ready? Here we go. Wow, now this is amazing. Now, right behind me are the ports and this is where I entered the computer. Well, this just takes care of input. Hey, check out these gold lines. There must be hundreds all around me. Those are the bus lines. The pulses represent the data moving to the different components of the computer. What's that? That's where the CPU fits. And this? On top of that goes the heatsink. The heatsink is used to move warm air from around the CPU to the fan so it can be cooled. What are these rectangular trenches? 
These are slots that hold the add-on cards. The add-on cards are used to improve the performance of the computer in various ways. For example, graphic add-on cards could be used so that better graphics could be displayed on the monitor. Hey, there's a stream of information going into the monitor. Let's catch a lift. <laughs> now for your task. Draw a diagram that represents how information travels through your computer. You must use all of the following components. User, CPU, keyboard, cable, mouse, ports, motherboard, bus lines, RAM memory, monitor, printer. And here's a hint. This list is not in the right order. Be sure to put it in the correct order when you draw your diagram. Finally, make a table to show the differences and similarities of RAM and ROM. Well, that's it for this lesson. Join us next time when we will be taking a closer look at output devices. And as always, don't forget to visit our website for more information. Bye-bye.